I am grateful to be with you in this campus education week of the church educational system. Most of us in attendance had the chance to read the 66-page class schedule with Sister Brockbeck's picture on the front before we came. It is worth careful study. It describes an offering which has grown to more than 1,000 classes in this 74th year, with, I think, 180 faculty members, and it said more than 600 volunteers. The description of what has been accomplished and will be provided fills our hearts with gratitude for those who have spent more hours than I can imagine to plan this great enterprise, for teachers who have invested lifetimes preparing for their presentations, and for those who will make it so enjoyable, including hundreds of employees of BYU. For the church educational system and for all of us, I ask that President Merrill J. Bateman extend our thanks to the people of BYU who in this Education Week bless our lives and may not be able to be with us to hear our thanks. That excellent brochure also presents our theme, Faith of Our Fathers, chosen in part because of the centennial of the state of Utah. Here is what it suggests we consider. Quote, much could be said about the toil and the hardship endured by the saints in their westward migration. Our focus is on their faith, obedience, and steadfastness in the face of immense difficulty and uncertainty. It goes on to say, although their physical circumstances were much different than ours, the personal trials and challenges may in fact be very similar. End of that quotation. That set me to thinking about the similarities in our lives. If I could visit with each of you, which would be quite a task, I'd love it. Listen to the story of your life and what you know of your ancestors' lives. My guess is that we would discover great differences. Each life is unique. That struck me as I reread journals and histories which have been passed down through the generations, describing lives of people as diverse as that of Mary Bomley, my great grandmother, and of Wilfred Woodruff, a prophet of God. Yet I see a thread of faith, a particular faith, running in the lives of those heroes of the Restoration whose steadfastness and courage leave us in awe. Perhaps if we together today examine that thread, we may find it in our own lives and strengthen it. Those histories reveal as much about faith from what people did as from what they declared in words. Different as were their challenges and their responses, I thought I saw a recurring pattern. Here it is. They shared a faith that the kingdom of God had been established for the last time, that it would triumph over great opposition, would become glorious in preparation for the day when the Savior would come to accept it, would stand forever, and that theirs was a rare privilege to have been called out of the world to build it. They were sure that they were establishing Zion, a place of refuge. It is not surprising, then, that they pled for that Zion and that they expected not only to build it but to enjoy living in it. What is surprising, at least to me, is that their faith in that destiny increased when they pleaded for Zion to be established only to see times of safety turn to times of testing. Listen to words of the Prophet Joseph Smith in his pleadings in a letter from Kirtland to the exiled saints in Missouri, December 10th, 1833. Here's what he wrote. Now hear the prayer of your unworthy brother in the new and everlasting covenant. O oh my God, thou hast called and chosen a few 
through thy weak instrument by commandment and sent them to Missouri, a place which thou didst call Zion, and commanded thy servants to consecrate it unto thyself for a place of refuge and safety for the gathering of thy saints, to be built up a holy city unto thyself. And as thou hast said that no other place should be appointed like unto this, therefore I ask thee in the name of Jesus Christ to return thy people unto their houses and their inheritances, to enjoy the fruit of their labors, that all the waste places may be built up, that all the enemies of thy people who will not repent and turn unto thee may be destroyed from off the face of the land. And let a house be built and established unto thy name, and let all the losses that thy people have sustained be rewarded unto them, even more than fourfold that the borders of Zion may be enlarged forever. And let her be established no more to be thrown down, and let all thy saints, when they are scattered as sheep and are persecuted, flee unto Zion, and be established in the midst of her. And let her be organized according to thy law, and let this prayer ever be recorded before thy face. Give thy Holy Spirit unto my brethren, unto whom I write. Send thine angels to guard them, and deliver them from all evil. And when they turn their faces towards Zion and bow down before thee and pray, may their sins never come up before thy face, neither have place in the book of thy remembrance, and may they depart from all their iniquity. Provide food for them, as thou doest for the ravens. Provide clothing to cover their nakedness and houses that they may dwell therein. Give unto them friends in abundance, and let their names be recorded in the Lamb's book of life eternally before thy face. Amen. Now, after such a pleading, listen to some more words. Listen to the faith in this account, written by the prophet Joseph in 1842, nine years later after the sorry, sorrows of Missouri and in the promise of Nauvoo. Listen for this. See if disappointment has dimmed faith. Quote, We next settled in Caldwell in Davies counties, where we made large and extensive settlements, thinking to free ourselves from the power of oppression by settling in new counties where very few inhabitants, with very few inhabitants in them, but here we were not allowed to live in peace. But in 1838, we were again attacked by mobs. An exterminating order was issued by Governor Boggs, and under the sanction of law, an organized banditti ranged through the country, robbed us of our cattle, sheep, hogs, etc. Many of our people were murdered in cold blood. The chastity of our women was violated, and we were forced to sign away our property at the point of the sword. And after enduring every indignity that could be heaped upon us by an inhuman, ungodly band of marauders, from 12 to 15,000 souls, men and women and children, were driven from their own firesides and from lands to which they had warranty deeds, houseless, friendless, and homeless in the depths of winter, to wander as exiles on the earth or to seek an asylum in a more genial climate among a less barbarous people. Many sickened and died in consequence of the cold and hardships they had to endure. Many wives were left widows and children, orphans and destitute. The prophet, for some reason, didn't mention his father, whose health was broken in that terrible time, never to be fully regained until he died. Then the statement goes on to say, in the situation before alluded to, we arrived in the state of Illinois in 1839, where we found a hospitable people and a friendly home, a people who are willing to be governed by the principles of law and humanity. We have commenced to build a city called Nauvoo in Hancock County. We number from six to 8,000 here, besides vast numbers in the county around. And in almost every county of the state, we have a city charter granted us the charter for a legion, the troops of which now number 1,500. 
We have also a charter for a university, for an agricultural and manufacturing society, have our own laws and administrators, and possess all the privileges that other free and enlightened citizens enjoy. Persecution has not stopped the progress of truth, but has only added fuel to the flame. It has spread with increasing rapidity, proud of the cause which they have espoused and conscious of our innocence and of the truth of their system midst calumny and reproach have the elders of this church gone forth and planted the gospel in every state in the Union. It has penetrated our cities, it has spread over our villages, and has caused thousands of our intelligent, noble, and patriotic citizens to obey its divine mandates and be governed by its sacred truths. It has also spread into England, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales, where in the year 1840, a few of our missionaries were sent and over 5,000 joined the standard of truth. There are numbers now joining in every land. Our missionaries are going forth to different nations and in Germany, Palestine, New Holland, Australia, the East Indies and other places, the standard of truth has been erected. No unhallowed hand can stop the work from progressing. Persecutions may rage, mobs may combine, calumny may defame, but the truth of God will go forth boldly, nobly, and independent till it has penetrated every continent, visited every clime, swept every country, and sounded in every ear, till the purposes of God shall be accomplished. And the great Jehovah shall say, the work is done. Now from that, you can learn some things. We can learn some things. The prophet and the faithful saints expected trials. They knew the Lord would deliver them. They believed what Nephi taught. But behold, I, Nephi, will show unto you that the tender mercies of the Lord are over all those whom he hath chosen because of their faith, to make them mighty, even under the power of deliverance. And they knew they would need such deliverance time and time again as opposition would rise. They knew that the times of peace would be temporary, and so made of them times of gratitude and of boldness to go forward with the work. As the leaders grew in faith through the cycles of opposition and deliverance, followed by more opposition, so did the people. One was my great-grandmother, Mary Bomley a little black-eyed teenage convert from Switzerland when she crossed the plains. I recently stood in the area of her childhood. I had always pictured it on the side of an alp, but I was wrong. It is in the green rolling hills of northern Switzerland with rich farmland and productive vineyards. I wish we'd been able to find the house where the missionaries taught her and her family and where they all came to know that the gospel of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God had been restored, and where they chose to give their lives to the kingdom. The two older boys to go on missions soon after their baptism, and the rest to gather to America to build Zion. They left a beautiful place of safety for the unknown. Mary chose to let the others go first without her, she knew she could make the money for passage with her weaving, but the others could not. So she chose to let them go on missions and to America, using all the money their family could get from selling all they owned. She went alone from city to city, Zurich to Berlin, weaving cloth for women, trusting in God. She also got herself arrested for preaching the gospel where it was illegal in Germany because she could not contain the good news within her. She was soon cast out of prison for preaching there too. <laughs> she got to America, joined a pioneer company, and walked across the plains. She described that crossing on foot as one of the happiest times of her life, and she wouldn't let her children and grandchildren call her a hero. 
On that walk, she met a returning missionary, Henry Eyring. They went in front of the wagon train. You should remember this in case you're ever there to be clear of the dust. They described later that trek not as a trial, but as a time of joy as they told each other. What a remarkable chance was theirs to have been found by the servants of God, she in Switzerland, he in St. Louis, and to be allowed to help build the kingdom of God in the last days. They fell in love. For them, that passage was not a trial but a time of refreshing, a refuge. They chose to see in it a respite. He from his five-year mission and she from working her way alone from Switzerland. It was their youthful faith that made it a romantic stroll. But for Mary and for Henry, trials began in the promised land. After their marriage, only Mary's weaving kept them from starvation. Henry was university trained in Germany, but ignorant of the skills needed to pioneer in the wilderness. They built a small home. Neither of them knew how to make adobe bricks. When the rains came, the roof leaked, and then a wall collapsed. It fell on Mary, who was pregnant with their first child. Only the remarkable fact that her loom protected her from the falling bricks saved her from greater harm. The child she was carrying was injured. He was born with physical handicaps from which he was delivered only by death. With ceaseless labor and prayers, they began to rise from poverty in Davis County and then in Salt Lake City. But that time of peace was cut short. Brigham Young, the prophet, suggested that they move to St. George. They went to the unknown again, built homes, planted gardens, and served in the kingdom. Henry served in the function of the mayor of St. George for a time, was a counselor in the state presidency and manager of the cooperative store. They helped build the St. George Temple, and Mary found joy in officiating there for 12 years. She wrote of that service as if she had felt the peace the Lord promised when he commanded that the temple be built long before. This is the promise from the book of Haggai not one of your favorite reading places. In the Old Testament, the ninth verse of the second chapter, the glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts, and in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. But then Mary heard what she considered a call from an apostle to move on from that time of peace. He suggested that they join in the establishment of the Mormon colonies in northern Mexico. They went, believing that the Lord would sustain them in his service. As nearly as, as nearly as I can sense from what they wrote about that move, they trusted that this promise applied to them. You remember from the Doctrine and Covenants, the 84th section. There I will be also, for I will go before your face. I will be on your right hand and on your left and my spirit shall be in your hearts and mine angels round about you to bear you up. They saw more safety going forward to unknown service in the kingdom than to stay with the known and the comfortable. They left what had become for them a Zion to help the Lord build another, not out of blind obedience, since they were invited and not called, but in faith that the wisest course for them was to go where they might best build the kingdom. In Mexico, the pattern of deliverance repeated itself for them. In time, they were blessed with homes and gardens. Henry went away on a mission to the south in Mexico, as he had previously done from Utah to Germany, and he built up the cooperative store in Colonia Juarez, as he had in St. George. Mary again gave tireless service in Relief Society. Their work and their faith again brought a taste of the peace that you and I want so much to feel in the city of Zion. And then Henry died. The Mexican Revolution came. Mary and her family walked away from what they had built as they made their exodus to the United States. She died a widow, a refugee from that idyllic time in Mexico. 
yet as nearly as I can judge, still full of faith in the destiny of the kingdom of God and in its head, Jesus Christ, as her deliverer. Now, Mary's story is worth telling not because it is exceptional, but because it isn't. The growth in her faith seemed constant in times of deliverance as it was in times of trial. That seems to have been true for each pioneer whose story I read. It seems to me that this was true because their faith was based in an understanding of why God allows us to pass into such close places and how he delivers us. The how springs from the why. The why is that our loving Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, wish for us to be sanctified, that we may have eternal life with them. That requires our being cleansed through faith in Jesus Christ, repenting because of that faith, and proving ourselves faithful to the covenants they offer us only through their mortal servants in the kingdom of God. Knowing their loving purposes makes it easier to understand both why they allow trials and how they deliver us. They could make all the rough places smooth in building the kingdom and in our lives. They allow trials to come even when we are faithful because they love us. There are some scriptures which now seem clearer to me after reading those pioneer journals. You remember this one from the 105th section of the Doctrine and Covenants. I have heard their prayers and will accept their offering, and it is expedient in me that they should be brought thus far for a trial of their faith. Here is another from Ether. And now I, Moroni, would speak somewhat concerning these things. I would show unto the world that faith is things which are hoped for and not seen. Wherefore, dispute not because ye see not, for ye receive no witness until after the trial of your faith. But for me, the greatest comes from the, or the greatest comfort comes from the one in the 95th section of the Doctrine and Covenants that goes this way. The Lord speaking to you and to me. Verily, thus saith the Lord unto you whom I love, and whom I love, I also chasten, that their sins may be forgiven. For with the chastisement I prepare a way for their deliverance in all things out of temptation, and I have loved you. I've come to understand that to try our faith is not simply to test it, but to strengthen it. That the witness which comes after the testing strengthens that faith, and that God's preparation for our deliverance includes timing that will best strengthen our faith. It is clear that the quickest deliverance does not always go to those with the most faith. A remarkable example of immediate deliverance is the preservation of the children of Israel, not when they were full of faith, but when they murmured. You remember their complaint and the Lord's answer through Moses. It's one of the grumpiest places in all scripture, I think. It's in Exodus, the 14th chapter. First verse is the grumpiness and the rest is the answer. Is not this the word, they said, that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said unto the people, fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord which he will shew to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. A loving Heavenly Father may have given speedy deliverance to help their wavering faith, while sometimes those with greater faith may gain more from delay. At least that seems to be the lot of some of the best and most faithful people I have ever known. It is for such faithful saints that the Lord may be giving reassurance in the words of the Doctrine and Covenants in the 58th section. Ye cannot behold with your natural eyes for the present time 
the design of your God concerning those things which shall come hereafter and the glory which shall follow after much tribulation. For after much tribulation come the blessings. Wherefore the day cometh that ye shall be crowned with much glory. The hour is not yet, but is nigh at hand. Now the Lord's nigh at hand is not often as nigh as we would choose. But he sometimes honors the most faithful by offering them the chance to share his view of time. And we stand in awe of those who patiently bow to the Lord's longer view in the process becoming more like him, beginning to see as he sees. Some of our trials do not end in this life. For that, our Lord promises us strength to endure this way in Alma. Now, O my son, Helaman, behold, thou art in thy youth, and therefore I beseech of thee that thou wilt hear my words and learn of me. For I do know that whosoever shall put their trust in God shall be supported in their trials and their troubles and their afflictions and shall be lifted up at the last day. You need to know something about who will do the supporting in those trials. The Savior himself chose troubles and afflictions so that he could make us that promise of perfect understanding. All of us who trust him for strength to endure to the end of life, whatever it may contain, treasure these words from Alma. And he will take upon him death that he may loose the bands of death which bind his people. And he will take upon him their infirmities that his bowels may be filled with mercy according to the flesh, that he may know according to the flesh how to succor his people according to their infirmities. Now the Spirit knoweth all things. Let me just interject a commentary. I think what this is saying is he could have known by revelation. He didn't actually have to go through it. But this is again what it says. Now the Spirit knoweth all things. Nevertheless, the Son of God, suffereth according to the flesh, that he may take upon him the sins of his people, that he might blot out their transgressions according to the power of his deliverance. And now behold, this is the testimony which is in me. Those words, that he may blot out their transgressions, remind us of the sweetest and the surest deliverance of all, of all the tests we face. None hurts more than the death of loved ones or the misery of our own sins. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, all are delivered from death and all will rise in the resurrection, regardless of their transgressions. And by the atonement of Jesus Christ, all may gain peace in this life, wash clean from the sorrows of sin and have hope of a glorious resurrection with the just. I listened to a man recently describe what it meant to his family to be built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. For them it was to know that their son would rise in the resurrection, there to finish the training of the infant son from whom he was parted by his death. Through their faith in the Savior, his family was delivered from sorrow and lifted to a place of peace. Gratitude for such deliverance appears often in the histories of our pioneers, partly because death struck so often and so early. We find less mention of the deliverance from sin since that is so private a matter but it was there as surely as it is in our lives. Each of us has in some degree felt the deliverance described in the history of Alma the Younger. You remember his words, which gladden us every time we hear them and bring back floods of gratitude for our own deliverance. And now behold, when I thought this, I could remember my pains no more. Yea, I was harrowed up by the memory of my sins no more. And oh, what joy and what marvelous light I did behold. Yea, my soul was filled with joy as exceeding was my pain. Yea, I say unto you, my son, that there could be nothing so exquisite and so bitter as were my pains. Yea, and again, I say unto you, my son, that on the other hand, there can be nothing so exquisite and sweet as was my joy. Yea, methought I saw, even as our father Lehi saw God, sitting upon his throne, surrounded with numberless concourses of angels, in the attitude of singing and praising their God. Yea, and my soul did long to be there. The peace of forgiveness and of hope in the resurrection can come wherever we are. 
The peace that passeth understanding does not depend on a geographic place. The place of refuge is always finally in our hearts. The Lord had that it had at least two meanings when he said, Therefore, verily, thus saith the Lord, let Zion rejoice, for this is Zion the pure in heart. Zion is where the pure in heart are gathered. That gathering creates a Zion. But in one person, in you and me, whose heart is cleansed by the atonement and filled with the hope of eternal life, there is a place of peace and refuge too. So we can choose to make our days here in this education week a time of refreshing in this place of refuge. The people I thanked as I began today, the planners, the teachers, the workers, all of them have labored to make this such a time and place for us. I thank them not only because they deserved it, but because we needed to offer the thanks. You and I, our gratitude. For them can turn our thoughts to gratitude to the Savior for whom they did this more than they did it for us. And when our thoughts turn to him in gratitude and in faith, the Holy Spirit can bring peace to our hearts, which I pray you are feeling now. With that feeling of peace comes a desire to serve. That's why those who have felt the blessings of baptism and confirmation feel impelled to share the gospel with others. That's why Mary Bomley went to jail. Now we can't get, now you and I can't get to all the activities and classes described in those 66 pages. But in whatever class we find ourselves, we can do what one of those hero pioneers might have done. We can remember the Savior and that we are blessed to be in his kingdom. And we can have in our hearts this question. How would the master have me use something from this hour to serve him? If we ask that in faith, with determination to follow the promptings which come from the Holy Spirit, I promise you that those promptings will come. We will hear things we would have not heard and feel things we would not have felt. We will go out from this place with plans to help build the kingdom. We will go out refreshed in our hearts and sure that what our pioneers believed was true, the kingdom of God has been restored. And we are blessed as the few among our father's myriad children to build it for the master for the last time. If we do that, I'll promise you another blessing will come from these days. Some of the words that I will read now will become as certain to you as they were to those pioneers. Listen to them from the Doctrine and Covenants, the 45th section. And it shall be called the New Jerusalem, a land of peace, a city of refuge, a place of safety. For the saints of the Most High God and the glory of the Lord shall be there and the terror of the Lord shall also be there, insomuch that the wicked will not come unto it. And it shall be called Zion and it shall come to pass among the wicked that every man that will not take his sword against his neighbor must needs flee unto Zion for safety. And there shall be gathered unto it out of every nation under heaven. And it shall be the only people that shall not be at war one with another. And it shall be said among the wicked, let us not go up to battle against Zion, for the inhabitants of Zion are terrible, wherefore we cannot stand. It shall come to pass that the righteous shall be gathered out from among all nations and shall come to Zion singing with songs of everlasting joy. As an apostle, I testify that God the Father lives. I testify that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came to the earth in the meridian of time, atoned for our sins, and established his kingdom with apostles and prophets. I know as surely as if I had been there that God the Father and the Savior appeared to the boy Joseph Smith, and that they sent authorized servants to restore all the keys of the kingdom of God for the last time and that those keys now are held by President Gordon B. Hinckley and exercised for the benefit of our Heavenly Father's children only in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I testify that this is the kingdom seen by prophets since the beginning and that our Savior is at its head in his name, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.